Hey there, film fans. I'm Jeff. I'm Dave. And I'm John, and welcome back to The Love of Cinema, a pod in which we'll challenge one another to discuss movies both new and old with a strictly positive critical eye. That's right, and to avoid any lazy negativity, we are making this a drinking game. Drink! Uh, what? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Any lazy <laughs> negativity is absolutely allowed, but it will be called out, and you will have to take a drink. Drink! Yep. So if you <laughs> hear this sound, it means someone said something negative, and we all drink. drink. So pour yourself a glass, join us, and give it up for the films we love, and perhaps the films that need some love. And we're back to normal this week, guys. We're back sort to of. normal. We, yeah, that's why we can't sort nail of. our intro, is because we just can't. We're just normalcy doesn't feel. It's like yeah, what franchise right. do we have to fight over? Wait a minute. What do you mean nothing? Oh my god. <laughs> uh, yes, we finished up our coronavirus franchise face-off, where we watched so many, so many trilogies and franchises. The better part of seventeen. Um, if you are new to our podcast, thank you so much for joining. Please find us on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, in our episode notes, you'll see our handles at the Love of Cinema Pod at the Love of Cinema because some fucks took at the love of cinema pod in 2017 from us on Instagram, those bastards made two posts. Yes. Yeah, so anyway, doing, we, guys? we, we, Post we, some we, more stuff. we decided that the Lord of the Rings trilogy is the greatest trilogy of franchise of all time, but go ahead and see our list. Listen to our podcast, find us in the feed, but we are back. We are moving on. And before we get into the films for today, let's kick it over to John for some shout outs. All right. As always, I want to throw it over to our beer sponsor, Carlos Barroso. We are very excited to drink his beers again. Hope he's doing well. Hope he's staying safe in New York mm. City. Give him a follow on Instagram at cbarrozobar 2019 That's C-B-A-R-R-O-Z-O-B-A-R-2019. And as always, the music you hear in this entire episode and every episode is provided by the artist Dasein. That's Dasein, D-A-S-E-I-N. You can find all the music for free downloads at soundcloud.com forward slash Dasein dash artist. All right. Jeff, what are we going to be talking about today? Bam. So last week, well, well, for those of you who have been with us from the beginning, thank you so much. You guys are great. Um, we used to watch new movies that were coming out and compare them to movies of the past, something similar that we could recommend. You know, if you liked um, Little Women, Will recommends uh, this movie. You know, I can't remember what movie it was. Man, we're, we're wasn't that Pride and Prejudice versus Zombies? Pride, Pride and Prejudice, Prejudice versus, versus Zombies, dude. Yeah. Exactly. 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 It's awesome. Yes. And then, and then, in the age of coronavirus, we realized that nobody can go to the cinema, and new movies were few and far between. So, Dave came up with a random, a random year generator, and the random year generator last week he chose. Built he built late. The random year yeah, I'm just never going to set it to 2020. <laughs> yeah, this is also, a, oh my God, never. This never, is also a sci-fi ever. podcast. <clears throat> um, so the year that came out was 2006, specifically the end of June. So in the end of June, we decided to pick out of the, basically the number one and number two movies that were the week leading up to July 4th weekend, which was Superman Returns was number one. And The Devil Wears Prada was number two at the box office that week. So we decided that we would return with our old segment where by the end of the podcast, because we are drinking, we tend to be a little saucy. And we tried to redeem a presumably a movie that that critics thought could be better. Cats was really fucking hard for us. Let's put it that way. Right. So we decided that Superman <laughs> Returns, starring Brendan Roof and Kevin Spacey, who's alive, but RIP. Um, we decide that that is going to be our redemption movie that we're going to do at the end. And The Devil Wears Prada is going to be the movie we lead with. So this again, this is the end of June 2006. It was randomly chosen for us, but those two movies, Superman Returns and The Devil Wears Prada. And we decided to relate The Devil Wears Prada to another workplace comedy with romantic elements, Office Space, another horrible Ooh. boss workplace comedy so Office Space, The Devil Wears Prada, Superman Returns. And as we were watching these movies, we realized we're sort of missing a moment in time, for those of you who are listening to us in the present, because these oh, movies yeah. are very, very, very white, right? So this was a, a discussion, yeah. This was, yeah, we had a lot of talks about this, whether or not to even do the episode, and we decided to go forward with it, but we, we are going to take some time here to talk about it. So Dave, why don't you get us started? 
Well, I mean, yeah, we, we set up the random number generator and it pulled up 2006. And as, as you pointed out, yes, the movies that popped out there came across as extremely white. Now, I mean, we had a discussion where your, um, you, you researched the rest of 2006 and it was actually quite a diverse year. But I also should we we can take a minute to discuss how this result can happen. Like our random year, two thousand six. If you take a small cross section and look at, say, Rotten Tomatoes hundred best black movies of the twenty first century, in two thousand six the list contains four films. On mm. average, Hollywood makes around six hundred movies a year. And this doesn't even take into account low budget indies. So this saw some improvement in the next decade, where up to two thousand seventeen that list contains 11 films and in 14 films in 2018. Uh, and then it just went up from there. So this is every year, the 100 best movies of that year. No, it was the selection of the best 100 movies ever, but the numbers increased as you went on in time. I see. Okay. And the implication could be is that, you know, black cinema was taking, gaining traction in that element. It's still nowhere near where it should be. Right. But well, the, that's the good news. I mean, the number seems to be increasing and producers are finally starting to realize the phenomenal skills and insights a diverse platform will bring to a table, but it could be much better. So uh, just on the side, a little bit of homework for everyone, a um, little bit of a challenge. Watch some of those films. Watch them on Netflix. You can watch them on Amazon. Stars has an actual curated section for black cinema and has for some time. Uh, Criterion Collection just removed their paywall for classic black cinema. So you can actually sign up and not and get all of those classic movies for free don't just watch the easy stuff like us although we love you jordan peele you lunatic <laughs> watch ava DuVernay's 13th or pretty much anything uh, by ava because we love her too yeah watch real pecs i'm not your negro and there's i mean i could go on and list them but it would take two hours in the podcast basically like the I feel like films are medium that's meant to inspire and educate. And I think a lot of, a lot of us have been skipping class, mm -hmm. including uh, myself. Yeah. Cause I have not seen all of the films in this collection <laughs> Same. and I cannot call myself an officiato until I do. Mm -hmm. So I would, yeah, everybody grab yourself, grab yourself some stars, grab yourself some Netflix and give these guys a shout out. Cause there are some really creative and really powerful stuff going on there. Yeah. John, do you have anything to say? Sorry. Here ends my here ends my statement. Sure. John, do you, do you have anything you want to say? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I kind of just wanted to echo that as well. I mean, obviously, we're talking about movies, so we'll stick with this medium. But I mean, it's the same thing, right? Like, we live in an age of content; it's just around us all the time. So it's like humans have finite life expectancies, and we live in a capitalist economy. So it seems like time and money are probably our most valuable resources. And since art and entertainment, movies, one of them, since it's such an integral fabric in our cultural tapestry, then as audience members, it may be really worthwhile for everyone to just take a moment and ask ourselves, what are we watching? What are we reading? And what and who are we listening to? Yes, the film industry has absolutely played a role in social negligence. Absolutely. But there's something that we can do, and it's by supporting undervoiced stories through hours of our personal time as well as buying theatrical tickets, purchases digitally, digital rentals, subscriptions, then perhaps there is a way that everyone can become more responsible citizens, which we all want to be, by choosing to be more conscious audience members. So, you know, we're going to keep doing our show, but I'll throw that challenge out there as well. I think it's something simple we can all do in our own time, and it's definitely going to be worthwhile. I got to see I Am Not Your Negro at the Film Forum in New York when it came out, and there were several guest speakers, and a super powerful experience. I'm definitely not as well versed as I should be, so I'm looking forward to watching as much of this stuff as I can get my hands on. And that's so cool of Criterion to put out that collection. So shout out it to was. Criterion really was, for yeah. making that happen. Super supportive. Definitely check that shit out. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of how we how we're feeling on the pod. But we're we're looking forward to keep going. I'm excited to talk about these movies this week as well. Had a fun week watching this stuff. Jeff, did you have any any initial thoughts yeah. before we really start tearing these movies apart? <laughs> no, not tearing these movies apart. Um, yeah, I was going to reiterate that too, because as Dave said about 2006, is that it was a very inclusive year. Um, but you know what it was? It was a very inclusive year for the cast. 
And so mm-hmm. I, I wonder how in 2006, it was actually one of the most diverse years at the Oscars ever. And I don't think the Oscars should be the standard bearer for the industry at, at, at large, but it, it is a, a tentpole for each year. It, it is a reminder of, of things that happened, you know, indies, big, big blockbusters. Um, it is a way of the film industry coming together. And, you know, last year in 2020, for the 2019 films, obviously they weren't very diverse. There, they were not a lot of uh, female representation, and people noted that, and they they were mad as they as they should have been. But in a way, if you see the protests that are going on now, it I believe that it accurately represented us societally of what was happening. We were not better than what the Academy gave us this year, right? That's my strong statement on that. So in 2006, we had five black actors nominated for Academy Awards. Um, Forrest Whitaker and Jennifer Hudson won. You had Will Smith. You had Eddie Murphy. You had Jamon Honsu. You had other um, persons of color nominated. But what it comes down to is they're all white filmmakers making the movie. So why wouldn't Oscar So White still happen 10 years later, right? So another thing that I would suggest on top of um, what John and Dave said, specifically about the Criteria Collection, but even beyond that, is who's making the movies? Who's producing the movies, you know? There is a way of being being an activist without being um, without being a protester in a way that you can you can find films that are made by by voices that have not been heard historically in our industry and to sit there and, and, and applaud something even like um, Dream Girls for instance which was 2006 um, Eddie Murphy Jennifer Hudson nominated Beyonce a lot of a lot of a great cast. White filmmakers. So those white filmmakers and the white producers made a lot of money with Dream Girls. They what they said is great. What's next? And there was no impetus for them to necessarily make another movie that involved persons of color just because Dream Girls was a success. Do you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. they are the ones that are going to get the next film made, not the cast. So what I would educate people on doing is finding out who's making the films. I recommended Fruitvale Station um, on the handle this week. Michael B. Jordan. That is made by Ryan Coogler. Um, it's a true story. It's produced by Octavia Spencer, Forrest Whitaker, and it's a fantastic film. Um, he got Creed and Black Panther, Ryan Coogler. He got them because of Fruitvale Station. So I recommend that. And again, yeah, do your homework of who's making the films and um, let voices be heard. That's what I would say. Yeah. Put your yeah. money where your mouth is, dude. They definitely, movies, they get theatrical releases, folks. I know we love to sit at home and wait for things to come out, but that is where they make most of their money. So if you didn't go see Queen and Slim, if you didn't see Bill Street Could Talk, and then you complained about Oscars So White, Maybe ask yourself, should I have spent a little more money, gone out and actually supported that film? I think it's going to matter. I think things like that are going to play a role. We can't just solve these things sitting around a kitchen table. You got to put our money where our mouth is. And I think this is huge. And I totally agree with you. It's time to start thinking about the production as well. Will Smith. Will Smith doesn't need to get nominated for another Oscar as badly as that unknown black filmmaker and writer who might not have a chance unless we start giving them opportunities. So same page, dude. Let's, let's put it in the game. And also let's make a vow now to just never limit ourselves to a summer release ever, ever again. <laughs> yeah, that was a bad oh, idea. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, wait, this is, okay, so this is the last thing I want to say about this too. And America, oh I'm talking God. to Americans. We have, inter- we have a lot of international listeners. Are you listening, America? These are the movies that came out July 4th weekend. So in 2006, you have Inside Man with Spike Lee and Denzel. You have all the movies that I mentioned. You had other... Um, you had other representation, right? You had uh, Babel, Letters from Iwo Jima. You had uh, Pan's Labyrinth. But when it comes to fucking 4th of July, it's Superman. Which, by the way, not only is it Superman, who Superman is Superman. He's a white man. Sure. Every single person in this movie was fucking white. And then Devil Wears Prada is number two. And as feminist as Devil Wears Prada is, that is a really fucking white movie. And those Ooh. were the movies that came out. And this is produced, back to what I was saying about who's making the movies, directors, producers. They in their head said, ka-ching, ka-ching, white movies on 4th of July, which I, I guess means a white holiday. That patriotism means white. That's what it meant in 2006 for sure. So something to think about. Yeah, Sorry. I mean, that, opi- that opinion's on record too. That's that's We know those comments are made. Yeah, so oh, yeah, I'm so, sorry for our listeners that so, came here for escapism, uh, but we're going to move on for now. But, this one's, but, this yes. one's for America. <laughs> this one's for fuck you, America. Yeah, fuck you. Take anyway, a drink. Yeah. God damn it. But let's get into Ugh. it. The first film that we're going to talk about is The Devil Wears Prada, which was the film yes. that came up. That was the one we, 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 we saw this week and we said, Devil Wears Prada, we really want to talk about this movie. So Devil Wears Prada is where we're starting off with anybody... <laughs> Anybody want to dive in? Who wants to go? John, Dave? 
David I'll go first. Yeah, I feel yeah, like you were. Dude, yeah. <laughs> I, I like I hadn't seen this. Um, like most never, of these, never, actually, believe, at it all. Or, believe it or not, I hadn't seen Devil Wells Prada. I also okay. hadn't seen Office Space. What? I, what? I, it's one. Of, it's wow. one of those ones where you just. I don't know how that happened, but I, yeah. I hadn't. And, Dave's uh, not from so, America. It's a very American film. <laughs> not that you don't know no, your dude, American cinema. Office Space but. was on the shelf at the video store in Australia as well. It was it was a classic, <sighs> the world round. But for right, some reason, m- I just couple. never ever got to it. And mm-hmm. uh, but Devil Wears Prada, um, I I wasn't sure what to expect. I'm like, all right, we got Anne Hathaway here in a fashion job, and it kicked in. And holy crap, I love this movie. <laughs> Devil's Prada? We, yeah. Yeah, me It was too. amazing. No, but the reason, there's several reasons I love it that other people might not. Oh. I mean, well, I found a very interesting website where I was like, when I was looking up like things about the movie and uh, somebody did a scientific comparison and like ran numbers and all sorts of shit. And this is actually number six of Meryl Streep's 20 Oscar nominations. Wow. It's ranked number six. In a league. Other Oscar nominations. Wait, wait, uh, number one, as in like, num- as in like the best in a, of her Oscars. In a, in a, in a, in a, <laughs> oh, they ranked them list, one to what twenty. What list is this? What list? They is ranked this? them one to twenty. I'll send you the link later. They. Um, I like this. Is they. Yeah, whoever they were, they ran the numbers of everything, and basically like this Sophie's was Choice, Devil Wears Prada. Let's let's yeah, just juggle no, these. No, Sophie's Choice was one. Devil Wears Prada was six. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, these are not numbers I made up. Like, they're not little X's that I put somewhere. Some Australian no, right. list. No, they made them <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah. No, this is the list I found in America. <laughs> so, like, and she does really nail it. And I think the reason I enjoy this is, uh, and people may not not know, in between, like, filmmaking and that sort of thing, I do work a lot for corporate America um, in, Dave. let's say, an audio-visual Dave. capacity. <laughs> And I have seen this stuff go on in the many venues I've worked in. I've seen this happen in many, many locations, like people losing their shit because the boss is coming. Like I've like you see people freak out when like the flowers are on the wrong side of the desk. You sit like it has to be exactly like this, otherwise like and it's the terror these people have. And like and I saw this perfectly communicated in this movie and I really related to it. I'm like, ah, I, I know these people. Like I've seen these people. I've, I've dealt with these people on a professional level. And it was like, they did it so well. It just really, really spoke to me. Nice. Dude. Yeah. It was, it was. I, look, I, I agree. I mean, it's, it, it does know what it is. So it's, it is, it, it actually feels like a sitcom, but it, it's a rom-com. There are some sitcom elements in there for sure, but it is a romantic yeah. comedy, even though it's not so much about the the romance as it is about the workplace um, dramedy, I guess you could say. Uh, you know, it's, mm. it's, it's so obviously like in pretty quickly, she doesn't even want the most wanted job and then she gets it and then she rises to the top of the fashion industry. You know, so those kinds of things are there for sure. And the movie is self-aware about that, but it does it so well. And, and, Anne Hathaway is really great, and I commend her a million percent for when she starts playing the game, if you will, when she starts playing along, when she starts dressing well, when she starts taking the job yeah. seriously. She, she doesn't change herself. She doesn't go full Sandy and Grease, right? Yeah. <laughs> she she she, Dude, she still my- hangs on to the smiley chipper or whatever she was before. So even though it may be hard to see her become that go-getter assistant, it is she she stays true to her character and it all comes down to Meryl Streep the dynamic between her and Meryl Streep that so is the in, most important in my, thing in my opinion Meryl Meryl Streep and Stanley Tucci he has some amazing and Stanley, scenes I was going to exactly I was Stan, going to say that Stanley's too. performance is phenomenal he's completely yeah. understated he's like subtle 100% like, there are whole threads to like is is that character gay or not because he he plays it but you don't know it and it's not a big thing it's like he just he, that's he is, his character. he is, but you're right. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. He's so like in the because this is based on a book, and in the book he was overtly. Yeah, and because he um, said the job that all ladies want, and then it's the job that. But anyway, yes, but yeah, the two of, and Meryl Streep and Stanley Tucci together, Julie and Julia. I mean, like, um, they never push. They're playing characters, but you wouldn't know it if you didn't know who they were. Like, it, it is incredible. Mm. But but yeah, every single I mean, thing Meryl Streep does, everything Stanley Tucci does, yes, and, and I, they they I really carry. This- yeah, I found it extremely well directed, extremely well paced. I didn't find a dull scene in the whole thing. I thought, I, I mean, I it started like, to it started to drag a little at the Met Ball, but they got through it. I feel like John's I, about but, to tear this movie to shreds. So I, I, hey, I don't that's, know, that's, I don't, I don't know that to be true. But 
I also really, yes, they they do the rom-com thing. And, and look, do they get away with it? I don't know, which is they need conflict. So it all comes down really quickly. It's a little, little, little heavy-handed. Mm. For those of you who have seen the movie, it's when she's talking to Christian Thompson, who I'm pretty sure is, is a serial, pedo- is a serial, um, not, not pederasty. I, he's, um, <laughs> sorry. He's, um, no, say it, dude. Say it. I mean, that scene creeped me out. Say it. He's a fucking, he's a fucking creep. But anyway, he's, he's at her, um, Anne Hathaway's friend's like gala gallery, like her art gallery. And, you know, this is one of those like workplace, they, they didn't actually address this too much, which is like, if it was the, the male female dynamics, they, they let it happen naturally. And I do appreciate that. But anyway, all of a sudden the other friend is like, what about your boyfriend? And this whole fucking thing blows up and, and all of a sudden her whole like personal life falls apart in this one, like basically like 45 seconds scene that I, I, you know, it has to happen, but at hmm. the same time it happens, you move on. And then eventually she just fucking goes to Paris and, and it's great. And we're moving. And it's, I think it's, it's good. Yeah. I was Dude, really, I've seen people, I've seen people ruin their lives in a day. Yeah, and I don't know if they really did full. <laughs> they, they did really full ruin, and and back to the tone about that. What I'm, what we're talking about, about how it's like very rom commy the way they do it. It's not basically like, is this really happening to me? Emily Blunt is really funny because she's a bully. Yeah. She's a full on bully, but it's it's almost it's honestly it's a brilliant. I I, I want to study this tro- this kind of trope that uh, if she nails. You never really believe her. So even though she's a bully, yeah. you never really believe that she's a bully which in a drama would ruin the movie in this particular movie. It's fucking brilliant because every yes. single thing she says is rude, but the way she says it, you don't really buy it. So it's fine. And, mm-hmm. and it, and it allows this other dynamic that she's not just a caricature that she is a living, breathing human being. Yeah, she, she that does doesn't show want other levels at some and point. And you know what? Yeah. It, it kind of seems like she doesn't want to be that way, but she's just playing the game and she's playing it really well. And I, she's playing it I to win. Have, I do have one criticism that I noticed and it was a glaring one. And I had the same problem when we got to Lord of the Rings. There's one scene. Lord of the Rings. That's an, yeah. There's one scene in this. that's an obvious reshoot. And it's at night when they're doing the walking montage and she walks across the street and it looks like he's just slapped a lens on a camera that didn't quite fit. There's vignetting around the edge. There's a different film grain to the rest of the film. And it's like, it's, I'm like, what the fuck happened there? Like, did, did that just get shot and not put through any processing? Buzz David Frankel. Buzz, Buzz David Frankel. I don't know if anybody else noticed that, Dave. Which part of the movie are you talking about? She's walking across the park. No, it's in, um, the, it's in the, the montage at night when she's walking through the streets. There's one mm-hmm. scene where she's on the crosswalk and she's walking across the street and it's just a glaringly obvious different film stock and camera to what they use for the rest of the film. Yeah. I had an audio issue issue once. There was one scene that was twice as loud as all the other scenes and I can't remember. But great montages, great music. I thought it was, I thought it was fun. John, yeah, you ready? Let's hand it to John. <laughs> uh, so in 2006... Uh, this particular weekend, I was working at a theater with with some friends, you're, and we went to really the movies. With the and it was a very, <laughs> oh. it was it was a very very long drive to get to the movie theater. We were in the middle of fucking nowhere, working at a year round oh, no. Christmas theme park. So can we, we arrive at the can movie theater, and I was no. like, Santa's Village was the theme park. Yeah, anyone lives Santa's in New in Hampshire? The summer. Santa's Village in the summer. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Oh my god! It was terrible. <laughs> I'll drink for that one. Anyway. So we get to the movie theater and I asked them, none of them wanted to see Superman Returns. I wanted to see Superman Returns. They all really want to see Devil Wears Prada. And there was an hour difference in the movies and they refused to wait for me so that I could go and see Superman Returns. So I saw Devil Wears Prada with them. And after having seen Superman Returns, which I will destroy in several minutes, we, hey, I hey, was very a, happy. This is a positive, is a positive <laughs> film criticism podcast. This is a positive podcast. I was very happy I saw Devil Wears Prada. Um, the performances, I mean, the fashion industry doesn't really speak to me, you guys. I don't know about you. I was really into fashion oh, really? when I was younger. I have you, a So you were late to Anne Hathaway at the beginning of the movie. Yeah, I am definitely more beginning Anne Hathaway before. And that was it. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of where it's at. So I appreciate, I really liked Meryl's speech. You know, there were moments in this movie where you're like, all right, I see, I see. I still mostly resonate with Anne, who she is the whole time that she forgets that she is, you know. So when she finally realizes I've been betraying who I actually am and what I actually want. That's that's kind of the end I was voting, you know rooting right. for the whole time for her to get back. So I have a question at the end of this little this little rant I'm about to do that I want to ask you guys about how you felt it. Oh, oh you're starting movie. the rant now. <laughs> but I did appreciate I did appreciate that Meryl when she gives her the sweater monologue about where yeah. you got that blue sweater. 
And it kind of does help mm. you point out, like, because a lot of people, for me, maybe not a lot of people, but for me, you know, I see this high fashion. We all live in New York City, definitely have been exposed to Fashion Week. I have some friends in the fashion industry, plenty of model friends. Um, and I've always been able to appreciate the art, like seeing art on stage in movement on beautiful bodies. Sure. Like that, just that surface layer, look how beautiful that human is with that strange piece of clothing on that might never actually make it to a rack, but God damn it. That's, I want to take a picture of that. But I have always had like a little, you know, there's been a little dissonance for me between that and the rack at any given clothing store or, or a boutique or something. So it was cool. Yeah, I mean, you some know, of that stuff can't make the rack because it doesn't fit through a standard built door. I mean, honestly. I've seen some of those shoulder pads, dude. <laughs> honestly, dude. So, Four foot shoulder pads, what's going on? What is going on? So I did appreciate right. that. I, uh, it, it was cool hearing someone from the top. I know Anna, Anna Winter, is that her name? Anna Winter, I don't want to yeah. fuck that up. She's, yeah, she's, so this male character is based on her for the editor of Vogue. So if part of the mission of this movie was to kind of expose people who norm- may, you know, might not normally understand the fashion industry or be a part of it, it gave me both things. I think it made me hate it even more for the things that Anne Hathaway gets exposed to and bullied for, <laughs> and also appreciate the artistic business side of what they're doing, that it does actually infiltrate most fashion. That those decisions they make at the top actually do have some kind of impact on the stuff that most people eventually buy and the lower, you know, the lower echelon stores yeah. that they're not spending hundreds that, of dollars that's on. That's terrifying. Which is crazy. You know, I really have never yeah. thought about the the train, the clothing train from where the influence of that V-neck yeah. t-shirt came from. Well, it's from De Laurenta's 1994 show and it's still here. That color didn't exist. Whatever. Um, but if I'm being real, most of this movie is fun for me because of the performances. Um, obviously, Meryl. Yeah, of course. I don't even want to yeah. talk about her. I mean, she's just, it's just, of course, she's great. That's all. That's all. That's all. You know, she's fucking great. Did you, did you see uh, that the, was my, the note? Did you see the note where she turned down the film the first time because they lowballed her salary? She was like, I'm, nope, I'm out. And they came back and doubled the offer. That's because she was getting into character. Yeah. She was like. But it's like, can you. I, that's the other point. It's like, can you stop doing that to female filmmakers, please? Stop lowballing their salary. Oh, yeah. I mean, she was going to cool carry this, too. Like, yeah. Anne Hathaway was coming up. But, like, we were going to see it because we heard Meryl Streep was playing a bitch in it. And we were very excited yeah. to watch her play this amazing. Apparently, uh, apparently, they originally offered the role to Glenn Close. She would have been wonderful, too. What's the right yeah, she term? T- she- uh, boss bitch. Is that the right I, term? I for- do not know. Yeah, I wouldn't test bitch, right? out pro feminist faces. On no, the no. You know the, you know the <laughs> Parks and Rec episode? It's not bitch boss. Just, it's boss just, bitch. Boss bitch, for sure. Just, yeah, just yeah. in case. Yeah. <laughs> just in case. This is for me. Yeah. Uh, this was my first time consciously noticing Emily Blunt. And I was, yeah. I remember laughing really hard in the theater. Yeah. I still, you know, it, this movie gets quoted so often. So I didn't, I didn't laugh as hard out loud this time around. I didn't, I smiled a lot, but everyone Same. quotes this movie so much now that you, you kind of, you know, I was kind of anticipating some of the jokes. Stanley Tucci, again, he blew me away. Wasn't quite mm-hmm. sure. I'm just going to open this Pandora's box a little bit. There's a lot of PC stuff that made me cringe a little bit watching it this time around that I wasn't affected by in 2006. Obviously, this. Did you, you watch know. it on Disney Plus? Because they might have dubbed it. <laughs> no, no, I just thought this was, this was a this was a super white movie. This white woman who didn't even want this job came in and got it and rose to the top of the fashion she industry. She rose to the head even... of the fashion industry. She showed up to work on the first day in the fashion industry in a boxy sweater that you get an LL Bean. But it's a movie. They said she looks fat the entire time, which I guess was supposed to be a joke because she really Size wasn't fat at all. Size six is fat. Yeah, it's tricky. <laughs> she wasn't fat at all. Stanley Tucci's not gay. When did uh, Brokeback Mountain come out? 2006? Oh, 2005. 2005. So yeah, the airport. once again, like Stanley Tucci is amazing in it, but I guess they could have cast a, a gay actor, but they didn't. That was fine. Um, there were some things with the way... I, I'm just curious if this movie, if everyone that loved it as much as they did in 2006, if they were to rewatch it now, how they would feel. Cause Dave, it's cool hearing someone talk about it who has never seen it before. Cause mm. if, if I'm being totally honest, I didn't like it as much as I did when I first saw it. I was so pleasantly surprised with, when I watched it with my cast that first time and I laughed a lot 
and it gave me that insight into the fashion industry. It was fun hearing them all talk about it because they were super into fashion. So we had a nice car ride conversation back. And rewatching it this time, I remember thinking this doesn't, I don't know if this floats quite as well in this day and age with all the, the PC talk about feminism, body positive consciousness, inclusivity. That is not the only way to watch a movie. I am not saying that. Of course, we have to check those things when we watch movies in the past. But um, I don't know if I'll ever watch this movie again. If I'm being honest with you, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'll feel a need to check back in with Devil Wears Prada unless I want to watch those three really wonderful performances. Anne Hathaway was good as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, she just, you know, she's playing the straight person, you know, so it's never quite as crazy. Those character performances, though, Meryl Streep, Stanley Tucci, and Emily Blunt are yeah. wonderful. So from the acting yeah. perspective, check in, watch this movie, watch them make you laugh, watch them make you cringe, watch them move you. That scene between Stanley and Anne. Not when he does the makeover, but when he comes to He doesn't to do the makeover. The makeover's her. off camera. It's annoying. Yeah. I want a good <laughs> well, makeover montage. Are you, are you talking about when she comes in to get uh, advice from him? When she comes in to get advice. Yeah, the two scenes. The advice yeah. scene is great. and he. But yeah. even that one made me cringe a little bit. I was like, man, he's being really bitchy. Like, I don't know. I'm just curious how I mean, other people are feeling about is, it. He is, but he's also not lying. I, I know. know. So I, it's like, I, yeah, he's, I totally he's agree. putting in her place. And he's, totally he's number two at a fashion magazine. Like, is he really going to be like, oh, my God, in the middle of my workday, I would love to take some time to talk to you about shit you should already know. Yeah, definitely. So in a way, I totally bought it. And I really like the aha moment that they did, which is, you know, these moments are really hard in, in film, but where she doesn't want to say, I need your help. And he looks at her and he goes, what? No, no. <laughs> Without yeah. her having to say it. I think they pulled that moment off really well, which is cool. Sorry, Absolutely. John. Yeah, yeah, All right. Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. Just, just to bring this around, though. So do you have a favorite line out of the movie? Because mine is a complete throwaway line. I don't think I retained a favorite line, but it's probably something and, out of Stanley Tucci's mouth. <laughs> and mine, mine is like something, so a level of ridiculousness that I've expected. When they're doing the desk montage where she just walks in, throws her stuff on the desk and asks for something and walks off. Oh, yeah, 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 there's yeah, yeah, yeah. one line in there where she walks in, throws her shit down and asks, where's that piece of paper I had in my hand yesterday morning? Oh, that's good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pissed myself laughing, out fell out of my chair. It's the most <sighs> ridiculous request. Oh, that like, is good, dude. I've I've seen that come out of people's mouths in like corporate America. It's like, <laughs> no, you're totally Honestly, right. I remember. I'm glad you said that because I remember laughing pretty hard. I did laugh. Maybe that too. was the only time yeah. I laughed out loud at this at this watch. Yeah, because yeah, too. in my mind, I'm like, Sorry. I don't know. Where did you fucking leave it? Like, <laughs> it's a ridiculous like, request. I like there's so there's awesome. One- there's one time where, where Anne Hathaway is is coming is coming back and she's late with the coffee and in Miranda's office in Meryl Streep's office she says is there some reason my coffee is in here did she die or something <laughs> it's like the, yeah. it's so intensive <laughs> but for me it's just yeah, a very it's a just valid a, excuse it's um <laughs> it's it's the very very end when you're waiting for sort of like the smirk after Meryl sort of like blows Anne Hathaway off and then and then she's sitting there and it's funny because it's like it's film funny you know what i mean because she's she, you have a close-up on meryl streep in the car and she's watching Anne hathaway walk away so it's like a film moment that's still and then she realizes that the taxi hasn't taken off yet so she just looks at the driver yeah. and she goes go and it's like well it's honestly it's funny because from the, the film watcher perspective the reason he's not moving is because we're in your close-up <laughs> but it's so anyway it was, it was a funny little like kind of but also it's a great throwback to when they're doing the presentation earlier and they're like yeah, yeah. she's only he's, they've only ever got one smile out of it ever yeah, in my exactly. life man. so again i like there the, is uh, a, the there's, sorry john it's like oh she's redeemed and then no she's not she's the same she always was i think the first one of the very first lines of stanley tucci's mouth when he walks in and he sees her and he says to meryl who is that sad little person are we doing a before and after piece i don't know about yes yes <laughs> it's so good <laughs> And then, of course, uh, the, the block the of room. cheese, the block of cheese line from Emily Blunt. I eat a cube of cheese. I'm about to pass out. I eat a cube of cheese. She's on her Paris yeah. diet. Yep. Are we allowed to laugh about that? Wait. Though is that so? Is that fucked yeah. up? Sorry. <laughs> we we are. That's a, she's a caricature. We're allowed she's to a laugh. Caricature. Right. Um, Emily Emily Blunt. Um, I'm sorry. Do you have a hideous skirt convention you have to go to? No, yeah, like, anyway, it's good. The, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, we can go is, on and on. There is formula in this movie. There's some like good 2000s formula. There's some rushed shit. Her training, her work training by Emily Blunt was 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's some formula stuff. But are we buzzing the editor? Who are we buzzing? We should, the we editor? No, no, we, uh, they just try to keep it snappy. But John, to, to your point, saying you never watch this again. 
I might never watch this again, but you know, I, I don't know. It, it's a, it's an easy rom-com. So it's like, if, if somebody recommends this, maybe, I, I hope I'm not diminishing it too much by putting it into the, into the rom-com category, but, but it is, it, it is, even though there's I mean, not as much comedy as work, it, there's not as much comedy as rom-com, but that's the way it feels. Some scenes feel like it's straight out of sex in the city. I don't um, think it's, I, I, don't know, say, I, don't, I don't like I rom-com say, I was for it. Pleasantly, I, know what you mean, I was pleasantly surprised all around. Me, no, me too. Yes, me too, for yeah. sure. Me too. What's the right genre, though? It's not a rom-com. I, I know what you mean. I know why you're saying that. That's the, the tone, feel of it. It's that, not that's a rom-com. The, that's the tone. So what is yeah. it? It's a, a, work, a workplace I like, dramedy. I feel like it's a, I, I feel a like it's it's not a comedy. comedy. Just so is it a rom-com? Like, She's having a rom-com with, with herself or with her career? Because I know what you mean. It's just, but it's not about a love. No, I know. I, I know. I know. You're right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the question I wanted to ask you guys is when this whole thing is over and... Aiden Pentanet, how do you say his name? <laughs> Who's her, you know, from Vince from Entourage? Adrian Grenier, Adrian he's not, Grenier. He's not typecast yeah, at all. Vinny, Vinny okay. In between his many grilled cheese makings. <laughs> so at the end of this movie, when he fucking calls her out, when she finally like comes around, how did you feel about what she took away? Like, what are we supposed to walk away with? That she needed to cut her teeth on a job that made her realize, no, I am who I am, and I actually do want to go for the thing that I was most passionate about, but now I have the skill set to do it. I wasn't quite sure, outside of the obvious, that, okay, she was in denial of what she was actually trying to do, and she did kind of turn into a, a false version of herself. Was that commentary on a little bit of the fashion industry as well, or... Or was was there anything that was more layered there? Do you think? It's, or was it it's just... a little bit of a comedy on a uh, commentary on how um, this sort of industry can eat your world to yeah. the extent of everything else, and, and you become a person who literally just has to please another person, no matter what. I know you're saying that's about uh, corporations and, and like it's the about, corporate it's, it's machine. About, kind of yeah, thing? it's about the fear that corporate employees have instilled in them and stuff. And like we'll touch on that again in Office Space because uh, there was some really good stuff in the subtext of that that I completely missed that my wife drilled into me because she's funny. like, she loves this movie and uh, like office space. And she like, I was like, yeah, I don't know if I got that. And she well, I went off. So we'll come back a little bit later. Thank you, yeah. Therese yeah. for fucking going off. I, mean, I can't wait. You fuck Therese. you, Dave already. But buzz yourself, <laughs> motherfucker. I can't believe it. Let's keep moving though. Let's keep cooking. We're going to be right back. We're going to be talking about office space in like one second. Are we the only podcast that just says we have to go pee now? <laughs> We're yes. drinking. We're, we're back. back. We never left. I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So our comparison film, we went with Office Space. space. Ben, we went with Office Space, the movie, comparing yes. it to Devil Wears Prada. If you like the Devil Wears Prada and the workplace environment with the boss that you just can't handle, but as an audience member, you can't get enough of. We compared Miranda Priestly to Bill fucking Lumberg. <laughs> Who wants to get us? I, I I just said this in the break, but I have seen Office Space at least ten times in my life. I remember very vividly the first time I saw it. It's so great. I'm not going to be the one to start off with this. Who wants to go first? No way, dude! You got to re- give it to us. You're you're so pumped. I Guys, can tell. I yeah, fucking love this movie. And you know what's so funny is this time <laughs> I was trying to recommend it before we watched it. I'm in a house with other people quarantining, and I, I was like. For some reason, I was like, I'm watching The Devil Wears Prada. If you guys want to watch it with me. And then Office Space was like, yeah, I don't know if you guys will like it. It's a little, maybe it's a little slow. Maybe it's a little boring. And like 15 minutes in, I've already laughed like 15 fucking times in this movie. Yeah. I think this movie's so fucking funny. At what? It's- <laughs> oh, fuck you, Dave. Weird. You're going last you know this time, You know what's funny? <laughs> okay. There's a, there's a clip online about Edgar Wright and comedy filmmaking in that American comedies, it's all about scenes and jokes and, and aha moments, which is why a lot of the Will Ferrell movies and a lot of the um, Judd Apatow movies have a lot of improv because they want it to be spontaneous and they, they want, those, they want the, the yucks, they want the jumps, right? In this movie, you follow these characters so vividly through each day that within 15 minutes on Monday morning, I feel like I, I have a pretty clear picture of who they all are 
they, I, the characters are so, so interesting in this. So you follow Peter going to work, who, who keeps trying to change lanes in his car on the way because he's in traffic. And every time he switches lanes, the other lane goes really fast. You have the old man in the walker that is going quicker than him. And so it's just like, before he even gets to the office space, yes, the office space, you're already like, like loathing work. And then when he shows up and you realize, like, he messed up the TPS reports, you have two different bosses telling him uh, with that, the memo, or the, 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 there's no cover Six page. Six different bosses. So he, has, he has eight bosses, but <laughs> but you only see two of them at the top. Yeah. And then he goes up to his other friend, one of whom is fucking named Michael Bolton. <laughs> and he hates the copy machine. Any relation and to the have, singer? <laughs> it is, guys, my one of my favorite quotes in I any celebrate movie, his entire catalog. <laughs> I'm just I'm a Michael Bolton fan. This whole segment is just going to be quotes from this Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. There is, my, this is one of my favorite quotes in any movie of all time. Michael, there's nothing wrong with your name. No, there was nothing wrong with nothing it wrong until wrong. I was about 13 years old and that no talent ass clown became famous and started winning Grammys. Well, if you hate your, him so much, why don't you change your name? No way. Why should I change? He's the one who sucks. And then, yeah. I, I, can I just interject there? Uh, they, they're actually credited, um, I believe, yeah, I was in the say Urban that. Dictionary. Yeah. No, no, no. The Webster's Dictionary. The Webster, Webster's, Webster's Dictionary oh, yeah. in 2018 added the word ass clown to the official English language canon and credited Mike Judge, who wrote and directed this movie. So anyway, look, Mike Judge wrote and directed this movie. I mean, they get points movie. for that. They get points for that. Prior to so it was originally based on this uh, skit called Milton at Work I think which was in the nineties and nineteen ninety one started on SNL and then it got a couple other it got a little bit of attention elsewhere. Uh, Mike Judge created Beavis and Butthead, and he created King of the Hill. So this person knows what he's talking about. This script is airtight. And idiocracy wasn't it? And idiocracy well. yes. And he mm. also the, the famous documentary. He's also yes exactly, and he's produced some other things too. The characters, as I said before, are so distinct. The hardest thing for me in comedies, especially in comedies, is you have to lay out all the story and the script, but it has to sound natural. It's the hardest thing to do, which again is why they improvise in American um, comedies, but it's why the plot gets so jumbled because like it's hard to put the improv pieces together and whatever. This The script is air fucking tight and every single word just seems like it just flows out of their mouth so naturally. I have no idea how he wrote this. All of the characters, every single character is interesting. From Tom, the guy with the jump to conclusions, Matt, who to me is a cross between like a George Costanza and a Mr. Magoo. He's like, it's, he's like, I'm... I, I'm a people person. <laughs> like that whole speech he has with the boss. <laughs> Gary, Gary Cole with his like monotone. Like, I, I'm pretty sure this came out in 1999, which is the same year of the of Austin Powers. So you have the, right. And Austin, no, it's not the same yeah. year. 97. Uh, 90, damn it. 90, yeah. This was 99. Uh, anyway, Austin very similar. Very similar. Yeah. His whole thing. When he, when he, when he leaves 17 voice messages for Peter and he goes, <laughs> Yeah, huh? yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but anyway, but the anyway, sex, so his sex right, nightmare. We're, we're diving in. His sex nightmare. Right. Oh my god, lumber doctor. <laughs> anyway, um, guys, guys, I know we're no. I, I, all right, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna reel it in. I'm gonna reel it back here. So the movie Wait. is about the movie is about how these guys just don't want to work anymore because corporate America sucks, corporatism sucks, and they don't want to just be pawns in this machine and then die with a pension, and that was their whole life. But the way he discovers that, this is what's so great. We're going to talk about Superman Returns and how they just fucking spoon-feed plot to you because they want to get on with your life, and it's just like, go fuck yourself. Mm. With this movie, the way Peter comes to the conclusion that he just doesn't want to work anymore and he doesn't want to go to work is he goes to a hypnotherapist... A man who is going to hypnotize him into a nice, peaceful mindset so that he can de-stress and choose what he wants to do with his life. And as Peter is getting hypnotized, the hypno- the, he's going to be woken up at the count of three, and the, the hypnotherapist has a heart attack and dies before <laughs> Peter ever gets woken up again. Now, I know that's dark because we shouldn't be laughing about death, but this is a no, dark comedy. Funny. This is a dark <laughs> comedy. And the fact he that Peter never what do you but the fact that Peter never wakes up from the hypnotherapist is and that's the oh. reason he decides to never work again for the rest of his life is one of the most interesting plot points I, I've ever seen in a movie theater. That is so unique and interesting. 
And then everybody else is like diving on this hypnotherapist to try to resuscitate him. And Peter is just sitting back, like looking around, like he's just like, it's as if he just woke up from a coma and was able to, he just like walked away. It was, it is so fucking funny. I, 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 I'm just rambling now. Somebody take over yeah. for me. No, but dude, I'm I, sure totally, I'll back in. I totally agree. I've seen this movie several times for sure, but I haven't seen it in at least 10 years. It's, I definitely have not seen it since college or something like that. And I yeah. was laughing immediately. I, I miss comedies that are like this. You're right. I'm glad you pointed that out. Cause I'm still a fan of Adam McKay's comedies and yes. some of John Apatow's comedies. I don't, I don't love all of his movies, but I do love like 40 year old virgin and some of the other ones, but I like Adam McKay's stuff. It's a different kind of humor. It's like that stupid yeah. humor, with Will Ferrell and John C. Riley, And it's still fun. I, I still like They're going that, for but, the jumps. They want the, but this, this feels like a, a tight actual movie that just happens to be funny. Um, yeah. There's so many iconic, obviously quotes, we could quote it forever, but there's so many iconic scenes, the destruction of the printer with the damn it feels Back good to be in that that's like the resurrection. I, I hadn't even hilarious. seen this movie and I knew about that scene. <laughs> when Michael when he tear when they pull him away because he's too upset and then he tears away from him again and just starts hitting it with his bare fist. <laughs> he hits it with his bare fist <laughs> and the pieces from the copier just fly off. Like, oh, there's so just so funny. much there's just so much there was so much sincerity that I love it in my drama, I love it in my comedy too. There's just so much sincerity there that doesn't exist in the same way that the the stupid smart comedies of Adam McKay exist, there's so much more zany, fantastical humor out of out of those out of those people. Whereas this is a little bit more grounded mm-hmm. in the universal frustrations that everyone has with their job and their fucking boss <laughs> and their fucking coworkers. Uh, even Milton, who is miles and miles Especially and miles away from Milton. from most human beings, you feel like he's super weird, but all of his frustrations are also relatable. Even when, when what's, what's the main guy's name? Peter. What's the main guy's name? Yeah, when Peter leans Peter. up, he's like, can you turn your radio down? Everyone knows what Milton's like, told excuse that me, I but I was wait, told wait, I could listen to my volume. volume. <laughs> Hold on, you love a movie, but you can't remember the characters' names? John. It's Mission Impossible all over again. John thinks I miss Ron Livingston. <laughs> oh my God. Dave, Who cuts fuck open you. a fish Go on his desk. Buzz yourself, you <laughs> Guys, asshole. this movie, <laughs> when you have characters this interesting, and your point of view is so strong, my they, aim is to tell, get John to tell me to fuck myself. At least I was told here was here's the whole here was the here's the whole line. I was told that I could listen to the radio at a reasonable volume from nine to eleven. I told Bill that if Sandra is going to listen to her headphones while she's filing, then I should be able to listen to the radio while I'm collating. So I don't see why I should have to turn down the radio because I enjoy listening at a reasonable volume from nine to eleven. It's like. <laughs> And but that's to- five times as much excitement as he had his voice. So when that's also, funny. That's also, he that's was the, one of my favorite characters. That's also the first time I've, I saw him, uh, that actor. He's all over the place mm. now. That guy's in like yeah, fucking he's in Barry. He was awesome ever. in Barry. He's in yeah. everything. He's, he's in so Dodgeball. Good in Barry. Dodgeball. dodgeball. He knows, he's <laughs> the one who knows all the rules in Dodgeball. <laughs> oh, but anyway, I, I, that is a good point you made, dude. I dodgeball miss, is definitely I miss, one of, Dodgeball is one of my guilty pleasures. I miss oh, this yeah. kind of comedy. 90s, there were so many wonderful indie 90s comedies, and they don't make them like this anymore. It's, it's, you know, it's Mike Judge. You know, he had a huge part of it. I was looking up. Apparently, this was one of his first shorts. This was his second short that he ever made before. Yeah, it was like 1990. He was like, he was like 20 something. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, super relatable subject matter. I love Peter's neighbor. When I, when I, when I, I typed his... into, yeah. Uh, yeah. Lawrence. When I typed into Apple to rent, uh, the office space short actually popped up. Yeah. Oh, cool. So yeah. Might, I, I believe you can actually get it. I think Peter, you can. When, um, turn on channel nine, the breast exam. <laughs> Peter, you gotta check out this girl. When, uh, <laughs> that was my favorite character. Car- was, he, he was, was in the Drew Carey. Character. He was in the Drew Carey show when this came out too. So we saw him, and he was like this mustachioed kind of like big guy. We were like, "Holy yeah. shit!" I thought he was the nerdy guy from Drew Carey show. At the beginning, um, when Peter's like, whenever Peter says, "Yeah, I don't know. I think she might be cheating on me," and everyone he's talking to is like, "I know what you mean." Yeah, I can see. Yeah, yeah I, I get that mean. feeling too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's I mean, so so good. So many classics. And Dave, I'm gonna say this last because I think this is gonna take you into your into your rant. When uh once again I can't remember his fucking name, but the guy Bukowski, the guy who gets fired, the big really Tom. intense guy. When Tom, Tom is sitting there in a full body cast, he's like, I used to hate my job too. Maybe more than you, but I tell you, Peter, if you just hang in there, 
you never know what could happen. I mean, look at me. <laughs> yeah. fucking... And then he does the best laugh to cry of all time where he's laughing, but he's in so much pain because he's in a full body cast. And he goes, oh. it is so, oh it is so funny. Oh, the performance is so, is so I, yeah, I'll just leave it with that. I am, the performances are, are wonderful. You don't, you don't really a see federal, that kind of Federal pound intensity. me in the ass prison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his nightmare. You were sentenced to you, a lifetime in a federal pound me in the ass prison. Uh, yeah, Peter, oh my I'm God. gonna need you to uh, Dave take it away. What do you? Why did take you it, not Dave. like this movie? What the fuck well, is wrong no, with you? First of all, Dave, fuck what you. is wrong with you? Buzz You're yourself. laughing your ass off. Listen, buzz to yourself talk about this for movie. not liking this. But Dave doesn't like Office Space. Wait, buzz yourself. Hear me, you hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. When I watched it, I didn't exactly like it but after, after, no no but after, after i had a discussion and i made a lot of my notes based on that but after i had a discussion with my wife and she went off on a rant i saw some things in this movie that i didn't you know see what? before and I, I appreciate it on a whole new i level. think we should get Therese in the room i'm just, just yeah. i feel like she should get in here she should just lay it straight Oh uh, no, no, no! So what no, did you uh, learn? I, I what agree. did your this wife? Is a very use the buzzer rewatchable touch. movie. This this rewatches very very well. Yeah, the supporting I mean, it's always the supporting characters. Okay. Milton, so, Tom. Look, I made a lot of. There, there's not a lot of negative notes here. It just for me, I I feel like I enjoy Devil Wears Prada more because mainly because it spoke to me on the corporate level. But in this case, this more was than office space? like. Well, no, these guys are like, like they're cubicle, people, and I do, like I've dealt I I don't have much experience with that so it didn't really cubicle people yeah yeah they're cubicle, cubicle people. people they fire milton and don't tell him he was fired for yes. five years five move years your desk all the way against the wall okay so but i i do like, like jeff's right about the opening sequence the traffic scene it like it made me appreciate the new york city subway in a way i never knew i could yeah it's like yeah. and i've been in that situation like um if you ever go to Adelaide in South Australia, South Road is exactly like that. You get in one lane, it stops. You get in the next lane, it stops. You go back, it stops. It's like, it's the worst road in Australia. So like that, that got me. Um, I'll pose the question to the world. Why do corporate offices have so much static electricity? Because they're oh, like, seriously, so the amount of times I've walked up to, in, like in high rise buildings in Midtown, I've walked up and touched a door and been zapped in my fucking knees by the charge that came off this thing. I'm like, what are you, who's, who's not earthing these buildings? There's mm-hmm. so much of that shitty, really thin industrial carpet. Everyone's right. just and like, it's, it's, oh my yeah, God. It's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's like, why gosh, is every, can... why is every partition, <gasps> aka cubicle in the entire country, the same color? Yeah, Every, it's the same company makes the cubicles for the whole fucking world. Yeah, it's just one guy making these fucking cubicles. They, but I tell you what though, they really he did master it. the art. That's of the, why. Like they mastered the art of the running gag in this movie. Like, yeah, the, the girl, the, your girlfriend's cheating on you goes on way too. The, the why? I think I'm going to burn the building down. It's goes so on subtle. The I'm surprised you picked movie. up on it. I I didn't pick up on it the first time because I thought it was just mumbled nonsense. And then when you rewatch it, you realize he says it no, every I single paid time attention until to that he guy says that's the last draw. It may that be worth reminds subtitles, me of someone I've actually, That guy reminds me of someone that I've, I've actually worked with. Did yeah. you know they made? And, did you know that stapler didn't exist in that color? And after this movie came out, yes, they released that stapler in that color. No, it was it did exist and it was discontinued. <laughs> That's right. And then people kept asking for it, so they started doing it again. Yeah, <laughs> oh, and people were literally yeah. calling and requesting it. Okay, but, sorry, Dave. but if if there was one like one gripe I had, it was like it seemed more like a series of sketches at the beginning, and. I feel like the inciting incident, which was the like, which set up the plot of the robbery, didn't really happen until fifty minutes in. That's true. That's true. But didn't you feel which like is fine? Rocky did the same thing. But didn't you feel like so did Superman Returns? Let's be real. And and it took him so long that they just... Superman Returns had a plot. Okay. <laughs> okay. But yeah. didn't no you buzz feel... required, Wait, Dave. Dave. No buzz required. Back to Dave. <laughs> and I just because I want to get as many quotes in as possible. They actually said the phrase "cock gobblers" in this movie, which is really funny. They okay, did. Dave. They did. Cock gobblers. Okay, Dave. Didn't you, you feel what, though that the char- every character in those vignettes, whatever you want to call them. Had progressed in a direction, so it, it, there weren't meaningless no, scenes. I, they I weren't the just way. I was, formulaic. I was watching they were so the, even though the, every yes, six, you're right. The inciting incident was late. Each character was on a journey, which the got them to the point yes, of the inciting incident. The, char- the other characters that you saw appeared for one scene and were never seen again. Like 
It, that, oh yeah, you're right. So there were two different kinds of characters in the scene. There were but even Lumberg was monotonous. That, those characters that appeared for that one scene, then were gone again. Right. You recognize them in people you've worked with. Yeah, the case of the Mondays like, lady. Yeah, was oh a case God. of the Mondays. Yeah, oh, Jesus Christ, she can't pronounce yeah. any Screw of the names. You two. <laughs> All of them. Yeah. yeah. She can't pronounce any of their names. I, and it's really Bolton? funny because really? when they when they when they first suggested the the crime that they're doing, I got so pissed because I'm like, they fucking ripped off the plot from Superman three, and then not thirty seconds later, they throw out a th- <laughs> Superman. Yeah, it's like Superman three. Like throughout the reference, it's like they knew people were gonna be like, you ripped that off. Right. I love. I, I also like, really it was, loved- it was clever. It was clever. I thought and, like, my respect my respect returned <laughs> after that a little bit, and uh, I cannot. I like in all argument, I cannot argue with the sentiment of the entire movie, which corporate America is a middle management clusterfuck. It really yeah. is, dude. The whole and thing it, is like, just ridiculous. There's so much like, when he gets when he when he's sitting in that meeting, uh, when he comes in for the meeting that he forgot that he had, and he walks in, the two guys are sitting there, and he just lays it all out because yeah. he doesn't give a fuck. He's like, "Yeah, I have eight bosses. Yeah, when I do something wrong, eight people come and tell me I've done something wrong. I don't know who's in charge of me. Like, the, this happens, this happens. I'm sitting there. I'm like, yes, this is the meeting we all want to have. In a given it week, am- I only do about fifteen minutes of real actual work. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I come in, I hang out for an hour, I stare at my screen." It's, uh, I also I, really I loved their. I thought the the production design of their apartments was perfect. I have friends yeah. who work in corporate America, you know, who are definitely we all came up together as children, and they have you know scrunched through those jobs and eventually have climbed their way into middle management or higher management. And at one point or another, all of them have lived in that exact apartment. Like, you know what I mean? That exact, it's like any place in any town in America in the shadow of some corporation is that kind of apartment building with that exact layout. The weird Mm -hmm. fake (laughs) island, the tiny kitchenette, and then just an open space in a bedroom. It's just probably furnished. It's probably furnished when you get there. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Also, like one of my other favorite things was he, like when he, when they were copying the virus, they named it Virus. But the the prefix was one of the earliest viruses written for the Mac. That's right. You look did you see that up? Yeah. Yeah, I looked that up. Like, oh, that's, gotta be an, that's gotta be an in joke. Well, and, uh, and it's like and we got to the end, like I got to the end of the movie and I'm like, what really happened during that movie? And that's when my wife went off. What did she say? I want to hear about when she, she tore she you came, apart. She came she came through with a how can you not no, like, how can you not notice that it, the whole thing is about how you cannot fix your life while your head is in it? You have to take a step away yeah. from what you're in before you can fix it. You have to get right in your own head and get right with yourself before you can fix the situation. And also, if you are miserable in your job, you have the power to do something about that. You don't have to stay there. It's a choice you make to stay there. There was a lot more. She referenced, like, Dostoevsky, um, <laughs> I I got I, can see like, that. I now know, I now know how she feels when I start talking about computers, but yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. So there was a lot of like she came out with so much great stuff, and I'm just standing there and my jaw hit the floor, and I was like, wait, this is a way better movie than I gave it credit for. There is so mm-hmm. much like they they have thought about this. They've included all this, <laughs> these <laughs> threads and stuff. It's like she <laughs> turned me around on this. She referenced Dostoevsky in her rant. Yeah, it's on so great. It's so yes, great. she did. <laughs> God, yes. that's so good. Dave's wife is a heavy reader. If anyone was wondering, I respect heavy her enormously. Reader. God, that's so good. She brought up Dostoevsky when she was ranting about Office Space. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, so, Dave, guys, Jeff. Yeah, let's well, all, I'm going to well, ask I you did, guys the questions. I did, I did originally. I did originally like come down on the negative side of this, but I have rethought myself. I no rewatch like, it. This is a very yeah. rewatchable movie. God, it's so much. That's fun. why it did not do it's, well in the box like, office. It's a it's a great cult classic. What would we you guys do if you had a million Anderson, dollars? Oh, wait, I was just going to talk about this scene. Hold on. It's so funny because this whole scene. I'll tell you and, what and I do, man. <laughs> Michael goes, no, it, I'm sorry. Peter goes, <laughs> Peter goes, it's so funny. He's like, what would you do? He's like, I would do nothing. I would do apps. I would just sit there and I would just do absolutely nothing. And then Lawrence goes, well, you don't need a shit. You don't need a million bucks to do that. I got a cousin who's broke. Don't do shit. And it's so funny because it's like the crux of the movie is all he wants to do is nothing. And he wants to get rich to do it. And literally the entire notion, Lawrence just 
fucking dispels it with his broke ass lazy cousin. I, I think my, my favorite is when he's sitting in the living room and he's like, Do you want to come over to the guy through the wall? And he's like, No, I don't want to risk you fucking up my life as yeah, well. It's so yeah. good. God, he's 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 like, the whole we thing. will tell and we Lawrence will tell goes, no one about this. We can't tell significant others, no one, isn't that right? It's all good for me, man. <laughs> he just yeah. right across the wall. <laughs> what the fuck was that? Oh, Don't okay. worry, it's cool. safe for me, bro. Uh, God, he also, is so what would, what would he do with a billion dollars? I'll tell you. Well, shit, man. You know what? I tell you what I do. Two chicks at the same time. What? That's what? That's it? That's what you would do? He's like, yeah. I, I damn feel like, straight. <laughs> I don't always straight. want to do that, man. You know, <laughs> he said, if I think I throw a million, I could hook that up too, because chicks dig dudes with money. Well, not all chicks. Well, the types of chicks that double up on a dude like me do. <laughs> And then Peter goes, point taken. It's so fucking funny. Uh, it is so, so, yeah. so good. Oh, my it's God. so good. Oh, I got and I, I, like I got a I, I was, broke. Don't do shit. I was shit. saying, like, when you, when, you watch, when you watch this film, it's not just lines aside. Like, you will recognize these characters from your job. Guys, the escape. No matter when he, what when, when he's do. trying, He's trying to leave work early on a Friday so that he doesn't have to come in over the weekend. And so he's trying to avoid his boss. That is, I wrote down, that is planet Earth shit. It is like a fucking mongoose, like, running away from, like, a fucking rock, a crocodile or something. It is so intense and you're sitting there and like my heart is racing and then that 90s feel you get when he's just trying to close his computer but like the blue line is like still not loading and then it finally <laughs> gets to the one. end and then it reloads again and he's like ah and then it just Come keeps on. going over yeah. and over and i couldn't I stop thinking about back. in that scene that was uh what else came in 1999 where somebody's trying to escape a cubicle the matrix i was thinking the of the matrix in that scene where he's trying to yeah. run obviously they didn't even know that but that made me think about that michael bolton mm. Michael Bolton. That is so fucking funny, dude. For my All money, right. it doesn't get better than when he sings when a man loves a woman. Dave, you're not going to so, get away yeah. without buzzing yourself because I know you didn't like this movie as much as us. So go fuck yourself and have a take a fucking drink. I hope I people listen to this and actually want to see this movie because all we did was quote it. And I feel like they just did. It was. Yeah. <laughs> they, they just saw the movie. We ha- again, we haven't mentioned Jennifer Aniston, who's awesome. Did all of her shooting in two weeks. She was the yeah. name. He didn't. They didn't want to name as the lead, even though a studio did, because he felt like it would take away from the everyman element. Actually, the, and the it might have actually studio, studio insisted on one name actor. Who was it? Not mistaken. It was Jennifer Aniston. They insisted on one oh, name actor exactly, so he could have the exactly. cast he wanted. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so kudos to Jennifer. And she did a great job. In. She was yeah. great. She really, really, really was. Her I flair, love Kung dude. Fu. We need to talk about your flair. This is me expressing yeah. myself. The minimum. Okay, yeah. All right, we've yeah. we've gushed enough. All right, should we day break or do I, should we just fuck? The, it's a it's a break. We're gonna uh, break it up and then we're gonna man. come back and. I'm just gonna gonna leave you. Hold on. I'm just gonna leave you with one more, one more quick little tidbit. I'll be honest with you. I love his music. I do. I'm a Michael Bolton fan. For my money, I don't know if it gets any better than when he sings "When a Man Loves a Woman." Mm -hmm. Ass clown. (laughs) Fucking a. That's not a a quote. That's John. Fucking a. a. Fucking a. Came from here. Fucking a. Fucking a, A, dude. (laughs) Office space. He's up. Oh, man. And we're back. We are back. We're back. We're back. Oh, my gosh. So, for those of us who have been with us for a period of time, we love you guys. Appreciate it. Um, We used to have a section on our podcast called Is It Really That Bad? Also known as the redemption segment, hmm. where by the time of this podcast, at the end of this podcast, we've been drinking beers for well over an hour now. We start to do our best to try to keep it positive because we are a positive film criticism podcast. I'll remind John and Dave that we are a positive film criticism podcast. And this week, same week as Devil Wears Prada, is Superman Returns. This is Brendan Roof as Superman. This is... Kevin Spacey, who again is alive, but R.I.P. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is Kate Bosworth as Lois Lane. This came out in the summer of 2006, around 4th of July weekend. It is um, five years since Superman disappeared. Superman comes back. It sort of follows the origin story just quickly. So he like goes back to <laughs> his original family home. For those home. of you that can't see, that was John just hitting his head on the table. John is and just so bummed. <laughs> and then he goes back to the Daily Planet. 
uh, Lois Lane has moved on so far from Superman that she is going to win the Pulitzer Prize for writing an article called The World Doesn't Need Superman. She's dating Cyclops. This, yeah, he's dating Cyclops, which is James Marsden. <laughs> who's a pilot, yeah, yeah. which is very convenient. Um, Superman's <clears throat> grand return is he saves Lois Lane, who's in a plane plummeting from the sky. And as he's saving this plane plummeting from the sky, Lois Lane realizes that Superman's back and about 10 minutes later says, look, we don't need saviors, especially me. Even though 10 minutes earlier, he literally just saved her life. She would be dead. (laughs) She would be dead. She did need a savior. Maybe she just doesn't need a savior at that particular moment. But all things considered... It has like 75% on Rotten Tomatoes. It did not get as trashed as John and Dave are about to trash it right now. Kevin Spacey was pretty funny. I know that's hard to say now in light of everything, but he's pretty funny as Lex Luthor. It was kind of romanticized at the beginning and tried to overdo the love story. And then the plot was spoon fed. And then it turned into like a bad X-Men movie for the last hour. John and Dave, do you guys want to start? (laughs) John, you can go. Uh, I kind of want to, no, you texted me halfway through the week telling me what you were going to, you were going to destroy this movie. So I kind of want to hear you go off. I've been <laughs> anticipating this. Look, I set it up for the audience so they could get some context. Look, but Dave, you, I think I'll, we're ready I'll to tell go. you what, like I, when I first. Brian Singer, the director of the unusual suspects in X-Men, by the way. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, and that's about it. Um, <laughs> I went and saw this movie with so much hope and like I know a lot of people like to flog DC movies to death but what I and I enjoyed this movie up to a point. Brandon Ruth he came in so sincere series Clark Kent, Clark Kent was awesome. I felt he was really good at the Clark Kent stuff. Um I there were certain sections I really dug with like I felt like uh, this, there's a sequence where Lois sneaks onto Lex Luthor's boat and I felt it was a brilliant directing and writing choice. Uh, Lex just walks out brushing his teeth. And it's a side, oh, of, it's a yeah. side of Lex Luthor you've never seen before. And he, he's like, he's got his toothbrush in his mouth. He's like, Lois? And then proceeds to take a prisoner. But I right. feel like that he, really he, introduced... He a, he didn't have yeah, it really introduced a nice human side to Lex that made his yeah. turn later, like... Bad. The plane sequence was awesome. I would compare that to the pod racing sequence in Star Wars Episode One. That's the whole movie. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Also, dude. I think yeah. Lex was being so kind in that sequence because he forgot <clears throat> to have a security detail on his boat that was trying to take over the world with the most precious minerals in the whole planet. Mm. Why did she just walk onto this boat? <laughs> Not okay. minerals, Jeff. So, all right, crystals. So, crystals. the introduction of a potential <laughs> Superboy. Uh, because it does turn out that uh, yeah. Lois has a kid and he may or may not have superpowers. Uh, yeah, they, I was yeah. willing to go with them. But then Superman just turns into this stalky motherfucker hanging outside their house. <laughs> the man doesn't talk. And that's talk. when this goes off the rails. They don't, they don't like, talk. <laughs> they, they, Superman is supposed to be like strong <laughs> and <laughs> fast and smart. And I feel like they left it out of this character. They left the smart out. Mm. The ending. I agree. Hang on. The ending is very, very <laughs> similar to the plot of Superman the movie. It's Lex Luthor trying to influence demand for real estate by altering the planet. They ripped off Superman the movie's plot line or like Lex's thing from that. I'll give him that. They put a nice twist on it where he's generating new like earth in the middle of the, the ocean. But then we get to the thing I can't forgive. And this is right up there with the bridge sequence in X-Men 3, uh, which was a fucking travesty. Mm. What is it's a really it? terrible movie, I, X-Men 3. Yeah, it's a bad one. Superman is heading out to fight Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor's generated this kryptonite-laden um, piece of Earth. Superman lands on this piece of Earth and immediately crumbles to the ground. Lex Luthor and his men kick the shit out of Superman because he's immediately yeah. lost his powers. He's yep. he's a human. He's done. He's getting the shit kicked yep. out of him. Okay, cool. He then proceeds to fly up into the clouds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have some sun hit him. Come back down. 
pick up the entire fucking piece of Earth and fly it up into space and throw it into the sun. Now, I'm sorry, the fucking yeah. kryptonite is touching him. You've broken your own rules. You set up a rule where he lands on this piece of Earth that isn't even kryptonite, it just has kryptonite in it, and he can't do a single thing. He gets the shit kicked out of him. But suddenly, with, with a little bit of sunshine, and I'm sorry, he was flying through sunshine to get there, he's picked up an entire chunk of the planet with kryptonite physically touching his fucking hand and thrown it into space. It's ridiculous. It breaks their own rules. It's bullshit. Their rules. It breaks rules. People, it really people is, know dude. that kryptonite. It Krypton, really is. I cannot get Krypton past it. Superman. Superman. <clears throat> have like, never seen Superman before. Everything else was like, was okay and was bearable and I was willing to go with them on. But I'm sorry, you broke your own damn rules that you set up in the first place. Unforgivable. John. Damn. Yeah, dude, I'm going to echo up. that big time uh, <laughs> just for the it. superpowers and the super thing like that is it's a good lesson, though, you guys, as, as our audience, maybe you'll start thinking a little more consciously when you're watching films about the actual like the way these things are structured. There were probably just a couple things that they needed to add in to justify him being hurt by the kryptonite when he was lifting that ridiculous continent out of out of the earth, which is I'll bitch about that in just a second. The crystals were coming down. The crystals of kryptonite were coming down. All they had to do was pierce him or touch him or he had to wince or start crying or sweat anything to give us some kind of justification for the fact that he was apparently struggling because right after that, he falls to earth. The last 20 minutes of this movie are fucking garbage. This whole episode <laughs> after he fucking... I'm not even drinking, motherfucker. You can buzz me all you want. That's not even a criticism. That's just a goddamn hey. fact. <laughs> Respect the buzzer. All right. Respect the buzzer. So one, the last 40 minutes of this movie is like no dialogue, which I don't mind. I don't Considering mind the dialogue that came before movies. it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind silence in storytelling in cinema. I think it can be some of the most amazing parts of movies is when you don't need to talk. You can just show me. But when the relationships are so weak, when there is no justification for the emotional relationships between characters, or even just a character and the audience, and then you choose not to talk, it kind of feels like you're afraid to talk. So I'm not judging him for his performance. I'm not putting it all on his, but they obviously went with an actor that looked like Christopher Reeves yeah. that was not a really good actor. He's not a terrible actor. He's just not good. He's not really good. He's not a super compelling actor. So when you watch him in his scenes, he, you're right, Dave, the stalker thing. What does he say? Like He echoes it at the end of the movie, too. I'll always be around. I'll always be around. First yeah, of all, it's creepy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, first it's, of all, it's, it's creepy. Clark Kent was way better than Superman. And I honestly did. It. Yeah, you're right, man. It's, not, it's really not that bad. It, it is fine. It's being somebody who, like, owns the fact that he's kind of like on the side i laughed a couple times there were some decent moments i really don't mind this movie up until the airplane cr uh, catch pretty decent i like the yeah. way they introduce him i like how he comes back i don't mind mm -hmm. really any of the exposition um but after that airplane catch it really falls apart and i don't even get that angry like i know i was i was just complaining about it it doesn't really make me that angry Anyone who may be listening to our podcast might remember when we were talking about The Dark Knight, I expressed, and this movie made me feel even stronger about it, I think there is an, an internal flaw in the character of Superman that they literally gave him one flaw. And it's, it's an external device. So this is a character in storytelling that has no internal obstacles. That just doesn't fucking work. It doesn't work. Yeah. Well, they did it. There's this. something I mean, about they overdid the, the romantic thing so much. Like this, like this kind of <laughs> this sort of like star-crossed lover thing that they gave him in this, that they really, they really overdid. Like in Spider-Man, the romanticism of like the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man, which was a little bit before this, that like romantic element of him and Mary Jane works until um, he started dancing. In, it's so hard to share, but in, in this, it was even the music. It, it was just so overly romanticized that when the switch happened, which is I guess you can call it the terrorist attack, then it just went dark. It just it just it just immediately all everything tonally that was set up beforehand didn't matter anymore, and I, I almost didn't mind it because the romantic stuff wasn't working for us anyway. 
because it, it was it was turning into it wasn't even an origin story because I thought the whole point of, of it being five years later was for them to say let's not waste time with the origin story we're gonna draw on the Christopher Reeves film this is this very much tried to draw on the Christopher Reeves film but it was supposed that was supposed to be I mean they even took Marlon Brando's footage and his, his sound like mm, obviously it was yeah. supposed to be it was it's it, I don't know maybe it's supposed to be five years after Christopher Reeves. Yeah, it's not the first right. time they've after, done that. After... Pulled, pulled movies like scenes from another Superman movie to make a sequel. Right. Yeah. And 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 so move on. Come up with something new. But if we spend half the movie trying to rekindle this old flame, that by the way we didn't actually witness because these are new people, yeah. and I thought this was going to be a new story. So that got really bogged down. And then so what, what really bothered me in this movie, and, and maybe this is a little too specific, is. Um, I didn't hate it because the filmmaking was really, really good. A lot of the effects were cool, especially considering 2006. I mean, 15 yeah. years later in IMAX and stuff, like I wonder how some but of that hold on. stuff. Just, just to clarify, yeah. I'm going to put you in a corner for a second because I agree with you. You're Nobody talking about the action in sequences, right? The, <laughs> Nobody puts baby in a corner. The action sequences are good. Is that what you're talking about? Because the scene work is... The, the writing and the scene work is just not that great, but the action sequences... Mm. Are exactly, good. exactly. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm saying. Um, and so... <laughs> So they, they decide here to have Lois try to... She's the only one at the, the newspaper that is investigating anything that's going to lead to Lex Luthor, right? She The blackout that happens because it's all... If, if you haven't seen the movie, everybody else is chasing Superman returning, right? The movie's called Superman Returns and all of the newspapers, it's all about Superman Returns. And because she is the history, Lois Lane is the history of Superman, the, they try to get her to write all the, news, the stories about it, but she thinks... The break-in at the museum, where Lex Luthor steals the kryptonite, and the blackout are connected, and she wants to chase those stories, but because she's just a woman who had a thing with Superman, um, you know, sexism in the workplace, going back to Devil Wears Prada, and and they, she, they, she, she has to do that on her own. But the thing is, they don't give her enough time with all this romantic shit she has to do with Superman, which she's supposed to be fighting against it in the workplace anyway. So now here she is. She's like, oh, I stopped. I'm just like the woman, whatever. But to the story, that's what she is. She's just the, the, the Superman interest to get him compelled to be there. Um, and then she doesn't have time to, to investigate Lex Luthor. So Dave, you were talking about the boat sequence before, which you're right. Mm. There was no security. She walks onto the boat. They don't even tie her up or anything. And then they do one of the most annoying things in any movie. It, really one of the most annoying things in any movie. Whenever you are trying to discover the bit of information when when you as the audience you're one step ahead of the character you're trying to watch them un uncover all of the truths you're trying to watch them figure out what the what's happening and we just don't have fucking time so kevin spacey just tells her he just monologues he literally he has no Although, reason to uh, tell her I mean, any of that the reason and i haven't she says, the reason i haven't Sorry, buzzed you, what you, you say? the reason i haven't buzzed you is because the villain monologue is definitely a superhero trope I know it's a superhero trope, but but she didn't earn it. The the writers didn't earn it, and we as the audience didn't earn it yet. I mean, we didn't have to struggle for it. <laughs> yeah, no, but we yeah. didn't. You're right, but I still had to budget. So sometimes I just want to ask filmmakers because these are. I, I did a Dark Knight Rises brand about something similar, which is just like, why did you do this? It, you have to know you're copping out. Even Kitty who is Parker Posey, who is on Lex Luthor's team, didn't even know. How is it that I, the audience, Jeff, am finding Jeff, out at the same Jeff. time as the team? And why are they playing billiards Jeff. on a boat? Billiards on a boat is a terrible idea. The ball is really the same <laughs> Anyway. Jeff, we, he this just, is a movie. This is a movie where people don't recognize the Clark Kent as Superman. No, I know, I know. But, but, I, can't, I can't even get... Are you fucking that's kidding a, me? I can't, that's a I can't, given. I can't, that's a given. But surprise us. Come that's up your, with pre, surprise. That's your prerequisite. Everything. And that's exactly what happens. He doesn't even have Lex Luthor lie and then do something different. He just spoon feeds at her. And but then after that, that that's doesn't tie her up. And her only security guard starts playing piano so yeah. she could send a fax while she's in custody. This is what I'm saying. Mm. Oh, wait, this is what I'm bad. saying. This is, jo Dave, jo Dave, you're right. Don't, Dave, don't go you're right, there, like, Just type in, why doesn't Lois recognize Superman into Google? And I'm watch not the that. shit that comes up. I'm not going to do that because you're right. You said, you already said it. This is a, a trope of superhero movies. You know what, Dave, you once said that they don't make old movies like that anymore because they shouldn't anymore. If super, if Superman was one of the first successful superheroes, let that motherfucker go because that is just not a good well, that superhero. Was, or, no, it, it well, is not that was why, interesting That was why enough. I loved what the, the change-up they made with Man of Steel where she was in on it Definitely. from the beginning and he was doing that Definitely. for everyone else. 
Or with Lois, let it be five years later, get rid of the romantic shit, and let her just be the best fucking investigative journalist ever, and give her a fucking challenge. Let her do that, but they they boxed her up. They basically said, we want this feminist character, but we don't want to actually write it. So we're just going to throw her into this, and she's just going to be the trope. They, they knew it's what they wanted, example, and they it? just didn't fucking follow through. It's a good example of, <laughs> like, we've, like, we've, like we talked about so much with the, with the franchises, when you're dealing with escapism... Especially fucking superheroes, none of it will matter, and you're not going to get away with amazing spectacle. Because Jeff, I totally agree with you. Like the 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 special effects and the action scenes are are compelling and well made, and it's sexy, and it looks great when he flies up above the earth. It, yeah. All that looks good, and it doesn't fucking matter because you don't care about anybody. Because mm. Superman seems like a an alien that you have absolutely no relationship with. He feels like he has no actual relationship with Lois Lane. I'm a little bit like Lex Luthor right now. And Lois Lane, <laughs> and Lois Lane doesn't actually have a real relationship with anyone around her. They, they try to force everything. Yeah. yeah. So it's just, it's true. And this is important for movies. Hold on. We don't have series to build up long-term relationships. Right, but they know that. That's why there are certain <laughs> formulas that work in movies, especially in superhero movies, there's certain formulas of the way you structure exposition and the second act to create strong enough relationships to justify the final climax. What happens in the end when everybody is putting everything on the line to help each other to overcome those odds and it falls apart completely. And this is such a good example of what you don't do. And it's such a shame because Brian Singer has been very successful at pulling off the superhero genre. Yeah, X Men was and awesome, and X Two were both X2 good. X Two was, yeah. was great. He's failed. Yeah. He has succeeded twice enormously and failed twice. Did he do X? And it's did so he strange do X3? that he. No. Yeah. He no, no. Last Stand was came out what? the same year as this. Last Last Stand came out like two weeks after That's this. That's right. He gave up uh, X Three to do Superman. Yeah. I and think you're right. Over and and they both botched it. Mm. Yeah, they, they came out like two right weeks now. from each other. It's Brett Radner. You're totally right. Oh. So he gave up his franchise that he did well at to fail at this one. That's great. So, <laughs> And he did The Usual Suspects, so he knows good character work. So in this movie, how, did The Usual the, Suspects, you know why The Usual Suspects? Is Brian Singer the one who, who did a third of um, the Freddie Mercury film as well? Yeah. No, he did. Yeah. Did I, I he forget really? how much he did. Dude. Because they, they <laughs> recast good. the director. I forget. But he yeah, did. No, he just went home and never came back. He's credited. Right. Yeah. Right. But anyway, The Usual Suspect is great because all of the characters are so interesting. You don't know who did it. You don't know who's in charge, right? All of The Usual Suspects are interesting. In this movie, it's less Lex Luthor and then like a bumbling band of misfits behind him. T- tell me one interesting thing about any of the people who follow him besides Parker Posey. Like, uh, well, like it's just like this buffoonish, cartoonish group that follows him around. And it, ultimately, it starts out fun. I, I, I'm with Dave on that. But they also give Lex Luthor like an hour of screen time here that takes away some of his power, even though he's funny and all, all that kind of. He's he's likable. It's it's good, but it's just the characters don't matter. The, when when Clark Kent meets shit, what's the, what's his friend at the what's his friend at the paper's name? Jimmy um, Olsen. Yeah, Jimmy? idiot Jeff. Okay, Jimmy. yeah, yeah, yeah. J- yeah, Jimmy Olsen. Within That's three you, seconds, Jeff. within <laughs> within three seconds of meeting this guy, you sit there and you say, you know, I don't want to hang out with this guy right now. I don't want. I don't want this. I, I don't know. Like it just the, the supporting characters. So the, the one that you talking about Superman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talking about Superman. Well, well, Clark Kent. But yeah, and I, I mean, kudos. He cast Frank Langella. And he made Frank Langella interesting. But but ultimately, the supporting characters don't. They just don't lift them up. Did and he? also, why do they play billiards on a on a boat? It doesn't make Jeff, sense. Play it's a different fixating. game. Play darts. It's, it's like Toy Story all over again. <laughs> the piano makes okay, but why do you play pool on a boat? <laughs> Also, there were some inconsistencies in the production design on that scene. The billiard, the balls were rolling, right? I, dude, yeah, I, I mean, that's hard. Can you imagine I, having to film that? I have, I've worked right? on a cruise ship, and there are billiard tables in the crew bar. A cruise ship is so, so much on, bigger than this boat. So hold on. Wait. So the, the balls were rolling, right? The balls were scene? rolling? That's on the pool started, table? Yeah. When it, <laughs> when it was yeah. between the swells of the waves, yeah. the balls were rolling. And then it cuts to Kevin Spacey looking at his library of books. There are, there are rings. There, there are like barricades of wire in front of the books, but the books aren't moving. The books aren't sliding into the rings at all. So I also felt like there were some technical things that fell through the cracks. And I don't know. Like once I noticed that, like I was already 
super over the story and the characters. I was just like, man, I'm I mean, just kind of yeah, excited I, to I see the I rest like of the spectacle. That might be a tad nitpicky. We're, we're looking at yeah, stuff. We, don't, we don't have to look at that stuff. They wrote themselves into a corner and fucked it up. <laughs> That's it. And and I just, you, you always wonder, again, I just always want to sit there and watch these filmmakers and be like, man, you're such a good filmmaker, man. Some of these effect shots are cool. Why did you do this thing that so obviously fucked this up that had to have been on the page? I mean, the this effect, is set five like, years quick, in the future. Quick Why note on the effects too. That was that was before they developed the uh, facial capture stuff. So the the actual like for the Superman plane sequence and like the running through the field sequence with the kid, they actually scanned those bodies and animated them, and then Whoa. they put Brandon Ruth and that kid in a chair and photographed them in 360 under different lighting conditions and map the face onto the object because they couldn't do facial mapping yet. So there was no like facial mapping technology. They had to like literally project that actor onto the, the 3d model. And they did a good, and they did, they did a, good a good job. Those guys cool. did a great job. The spectacle is the spectacle is not the issue. Jeff, I want to put this to you because you're an actor. I, yeah, I, I maybe I'll. I'm act not trying today. to bad mouth. I'm not trying to brad, bad mouth another actor, but we have seen plenty of movies who have been held up by wonderful performances by their lead actor. Are we going to say what this actually is? Is this is has this movie mostly failed because nobody gives a fuck about that guy who plays Superman? <laughs> I don't think. I still think the the actual like. <laughs> I still think the script on the page is is. I think he could have. Um, you could have edited a good performance out of a better script. There's a, I think, a, I think this, why do you think they didn't write him a better script? You, you really think, think that was the final a, script? There's a technique that Blake he, Snotty uses it, called save the cat. He wasn't improvising. And uh, it's in a screenwriting um, lecture that he gives. And it's like, have your character save the cat in the beginning of the movie. And it endears the character. It gives the character somewhere positive to go. Like it makes you empathize right. with the character. And I feel like no one empathized with Superman at all. Once he got creepy, right. we were like, oh, I'm out. They, you know what's funny? They made him a teenager. His, bit, his emotions yeah. were his, his emotions were like what a teenager's would be. But again, this is supposed to be five years on, in the dude. future. He should come back. He should have come back dark. He should have come back like scary and menacing almost. You know what I mean? Kind of more so like New Superman or, or just even New DC Universe in general. But he, he came back like a, like a teenager. It's like, I'm back. Uh, and then he goes back to try to rekindle his old love. And, and he should... I don't know. He should be a he should be a grown up. He should be a grown person. Lois and again, Lois Lane started off right. I think she did everything right and realized the script was holding her back. I feel similarly. John, you're right. He's not compelling, but ultimately, I think they could have gotten by with Brendan Ruth for sure. Brendan Ruth. How? Okay, All right. I don't know. Whatever. This, so we're gonna just by making the movie better. You think a different script would have saved that? Because I know what you mean. Yeah, like, I think a different think so. ending would have saved like, that. I don't know. This, the nostalgic thing. It was like they were trying to recreate the Christopher Reeves they were. thing. They definitely were. Reeves. They were. And, and it's like, and it's that's not something. But that's not that's, possible. You know, it's not. That's something you should never do because no one can do that like Christopher Reeve. That man owned it. Yeah. So they yeah. fell into the trap. So I don't want to I don't want to sound like I'm just picking on this actor. It, it was the miscasting. It was the misconception. There were a lot of things that went against it, but it certainly doesn't help that the person they landed on thinking we're going to try to recreate the exact same thing was not. He, he was not nearly as likable or compelling as Christopher Reed. Definitely. That, that was an and, obstacle. That's an obstacle for sure. I don't know. He's Superman. Like, if you don't want to watch the guy who's played Superman and you're more interested <laughs> in the CGI versions of him than you are in the scene work, then it doesn't really yeah, matter, does no. it? Correct. Yeah. And that's, no, you're right. And that's right. Superman I guess returns. watch this movie. Give it a watch. <laughs> I guess no. go watch it. No, Are we no, recommending people no. to watch it or no, not? No, we're not. No, I mean, we tried I to redeem this movie. Skip that. I know we're a positive yeah. film criticism Was podcast, it really bad, just, that bad? Yes, it. it was. Yes, it was. It was really that bad. Yeah. It was not good. I'm glad my friends made me watch Devil Wears Prada over Superman Returns. It's come full <laughs> yeah, circle. I'm full glad circle. they talked me into it. <laughs> All right, let's set up what we're doing next it week. It made me want to go watch. Uh, All right, yeah, no. fuck it. Well, I cut what are we doing next week? Anyway. That's okay. So next week. What are we doing next well, week? We're going to run the uh, the time counter, uh, the little time machine that we have. Da -da 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 -da. Drum roll for our year of choice, a random number generator by Dave here. What do we got? What year yeah, is it? It is 1979. Oh, fuck. You know what? Came? 1979. Yeah. So many good movies. Alien was the first movie that popped into yeah, my head when you said 1979. I, yeah. Apocalypse Now for me. Mm. 
And that's is that 1979? Yeah, it was. Um, Fuck. And then uh, Warriors. Warriors. What else we got? Hold on. I'm... Not Warrior with Joel Edgerton and. <laughs> yeah, no, not diff- the, the Warriors. <laughs> the Warriors. Hey, that's a good movie. That's Warrior. That's not Warriors. What else we got? Hmm. We got Stalker by Andrei Tarkovsky. Mad Max, the first one. Kramer versus uh, Kramer. Wait, Mad Max, the first Escape one? From Interesting. Alcatraz. Yeah. Kramer versus Kramer is good, but we should. No, not on this podcast, but no. Kramer versus Kramer is still good. Rocky 2. S- Being there. Oh my God. Uh, 1941, the the very unknown Steven Spielberg yes. flop that almost shut him down completely. Should that, be our, should, should that be our redemption movie, or should we stay oh away from it? Oh my god! You know, I've never act- I've, you know I've actually never Maybe seen. It. I would should. love to do that. Oh my god! Oh, let's do it. No, we're gonna watch the oh, so Steven Spielberg's 25th best film. <laughs> <laughs> out of, out of, oh, yeah, so out of 23 ones. that he's made yes. <laughs> alright you guys so we're looking at the list here in front of us folks we are going to vote on the movie that we are going to talk about isn't that what we're doing yeah. guys let's, uh, let's uh, pick one let's see um, okay. I don't think we need another Apocalypse Now podcast we don't need Kramer vs. Kramer Warriors is something that comes out of nowhere it's a cult classic, right? It's an, I've never seen it. I mean, a lot of people reference mm-hmm. it. It has been referenced in a lot of like modern. Fuck it, comedies. let's do it. Yeah, New York, it's a New York City. It's a, is it like a New York City gang movie? This it's a, perfect. Yeah, let's it's New it. York City of the and I'm using inverted commas here. Future of the interesting future. <laughs> uh, great. I'm done for that. I feel like Warriors. an asshole. I've actually never seen it. another really famous New York movie, Manhattan. By Ooh. Mr. Woody Allen. No, nope. we got it. We can't I'm do Woody. Out. Yeah, let's do Woody. We can't do uh, Woody. Woody. That's for Woody Allen. Male strips. Let's, let's do Warriors. Warriors. Let's go for it. So we're gonna do Warriors for our main one. We will tell you what our correlating movie is next yeah. week. You will get to find that out Correct. in real time. And our our redemption movie is gonna be the Steven Spielberg no. must see. 1940 fucking one. We're never I'm not looking hired. forward to that. We're never getting hired by. <laughs> we're never going to get ha- hired by Amblin. I, I mean, what, you, what has Jeff, Spielberg done first lately? <laughs> he knows. He knows. He knows it's a bad movie. Oh yeah, he has admitted it. He, he has admitted it. <laughs> he, he was like, yeah, I wanted to try right? comedy out, and it didn't work, so I made yeah, it yeah. next. I went, I went to Aliens. <laughs> All right. Sweet. So we're gonna be. Oh yeah, I'm excited about it. Let's let's do it. Feel free to check out any of the other 1979 movies. I'm yeah. gonna watch a couple Warrior. as well. Life of Brian is oh, a great one. Oh yeah, Warriors is a great drama. I've seen this. I Life look forward Brian. to watching it. Again. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It gets a All little right. dark, fellas. Brace yourself. All right, film fans. Let's do it. Everybody, stay safe. Stay stay active. Watch your movies. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>